Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Hi, I'm Joe Barton with Barton Publishing, and this is the Diabetes Reversal Webinar. And today we're going to be talking about high blood pressure and diabetes together. Two of the most um, important factors to staying healthy and not suffering from coronavirus, especially as we're seeing in the news reports. So that's one of the things we'll be talking about, as well as just the commonalities between high blood pressure and diabetes. And with us today is Dr. Scott Saunders, all the way from sunny California. He's surprise, riding, surprise. He's been riding around with the top down on his convertible, getting extra sun, and everybody that's seen him is like, what is the secret to your looking so young, Scott? Uh, it, it, it's my anti-aging program. Uh, it, it's not. It's not the convertible. Ah, I agree. I bet it's. I bet it's. Uh, we we need to hear more about that. So, all right. Well, we got people hopping on here. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you here. Say hello in the chat. This is an interactive time where you get to ask questions, and we get to them after uh, the first twenty minutes or so. Dr. Saunders and I will be talking about high blood pressure today and any other questions that you have regarding diabetes or high blood pressure. So, hey, good morning, Krish. Thanks for hopping on, saying hello. And we are going to be talking about, uh, he's asking us about when we're going to talk about stem cells. And that, I think, is, is that, that's next week, I believe. Next, next, next week, yeah. That's next the plan. Week. Yep. Yeah. So that'll be a good one, too. Hi, Tim. Good morning. Good to see you guys hopping on and all right Scott let's uh, let's go ahead as people are saying hello in the chat why don't you go ahead go ahead and uh, get us started okay um, blood pressure is really important and totally unimportant uh, the, the way we're told that it's important is really not important and, and the ways that we don't talk about what's important is what's really important. So what is blood pressure and what does it mean? Well, every time your heart pumps, it puts pressure into the system uh, so that blood can circulate through your whole body. And the, the blood has to go up to your head and down to your feet. And then it has to come back from your feet, back up to the heart. And that's a circulatory process that's going on, well, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, it never stops. So what is the pressure? Well, that's how much uh, pressure is required to get the blood to where it needs to be. And how do you know where it needs to be? Well, the brain actually keeps track of every single inch of your body and where the blood's supposed to be and where it needs to be. So for example, have you ever been like out in when it's really cold and your fingers turn white or blue? Why? Well, because the brain has shut off the blood supply. The, all the blood vessels close down, they get smaller and smaller. And they're white because my, my finger's red because it has um, blood in it. But if, if you take the blood out, then it, it, it turns white. So like when I push on it and the blood turns white. So that's what the, the brain is doing. It's closing down the blood vessels. So that, so that you don't get all of, all of your blood into your hands and get your blood cold and goes back to your heart and it's all cold and then you, you get too cold hypothermia and die. So uh, in order to preserve temperature, your, your brain will close it down. Well, that happens all over the body all the time. If your liver needs more blood, then your brain's gonna send more blood to the liver. Every time you eat, you send more blood to your intestines and all your digestive system starts working more and your blood vessels open up and let the blood in so that everything works. If you injure something, like you, you tear up your knee or something, it gets red and hot. Why? Because all the blood vessels are dilating so that the blood can get in there and heal everything and, and fix all of the problems, all the damage it's done. Okay, yesterday um, I got a call from somebody who had a stroke. And, and he is in the hospital with a stroke uh, and his brain isn't getting enough blood. So what does the brain do when there's not enough blood going to the brain? It closes down all the blood vessels in the body to push more blood up to the brain so that the brain gets enough. But this is kind of a trick because there's a clot in there that prevents the, the blood from getting to the brain. So more pressure doesn't help it anymore. 
So they'll often lower the blood pressure in somebody who has a stroke because the blood pressure will shoot up really high because the brain's saying, I need more blood, I need more blood. So it, it clamps down, pushes the blood, and that's where hypertension comes from. Simple, right? High blood pressure is the brain's way of saying, I need more blood. So how does that apply to diabetes? Well, um, just like that man with the stroke, because the one little area of the brain isn't getting enough oxygen, the brain saying, I need more blood, and, and closing down the blood vessels and raising the blood pressure so that more blood can get up to the head where it means, I need more blood. Well, in diabetes, guess what happens? You shut down blood vessels, you cause um, irritation in the blood vessels, and so the little blood vessels don't work very well. You get less blood supply to your brain, and the irony is, and we talked about this before, you get less sugar to your brain. So your brain is starving in this sea of sugar. Remember why that is? Because the sugar can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So now you have a starving brain, and your brain is saying, I need more blood. So what does it do? It raises the blood pressure. Does it help? No, it doesn't help. In fact, it causes, it causes more problems. So what, what we've done as medical doctors is say, well, blood pressure is uh, an issue. So, so let's give a medication to stop to lower the blood pressure. The, and that'll prevent a stroke, right? Well, wrong. And, and that's where all the research goes. You know, it, it's kind of funny. They do this research and they say, we'll take all of these people, we'll, we'll give them medication to lower their blood pressure, and then we'll watch the stroke rate. And what happens? no change, doesn't change a thing. When they compare the people taking the medications, the people not on medications with high blood pressure, they, they have the same stroke rate. So why, why doesn't lowering the blood pressure by itself do, fix the problem? Well, because the blood pressure is only a, a, a symptom of the problem, it's not the problem. The problem, remember, is your brain's not getting enough oxygen, your brain's not getting enough um, uh, oxygen and, and blood and, uh, uh, and not getting enough sugar, not getting enough energy. And so the brain needs uh, more, but lowering the blood pressure actually makes it worse, not better. So uh, the raised blood pressure makes it worse, lower blood pressure makes it worse. There's no way to fix this problem by managing blood pressure. You have to look at the cause of the problem. What is the cause? If you have a stroke, you got to fix that stroke. You don't need to change the blood pressure. You need to fix the stroke so that your brain gets good oxygen so that, uh, and good blood flow so that you don't need that high pressure anymore. That's why managing blood pressure does not help any of the problems that it's supposed to help. It doesn't lower your risk of death at all, in fact, it raised, lowering blood pressure by drugs increases your risk of death, generally. And, and so the way researchers have got around that, uh, the drug companies that are selling blood pressure medications, they'll tell you, well, we can lower the risk of, of non-fatal heart attacks by lowering the blood pressure. What does that mean? Well, that means people who have heart attacks and don't die from them. Um, by about 12%, if you take your blood pressure medication faithfully over 20 years, you have a 12% lower risk of non-fatal heart attacks. Fatal heart attacks, same, no problem, no change. You're not going to fix your death rate at all. Your death rate's the same or worse. So what it comes down to is you don't get the, a, a real benefit. I don't know. You know, there, there may be something in that non-fatal heart attack. But you haven't dealt with the problem. So that's where, that's where we go with the diabetes solution kit. We actually deal with the underlying problem. So when the blood pressure goes down, it goes down because the brain's getting enough. Mm -hmm. When the brain says, I have enough, woo, blood pressure will go down. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful system. You think like maybe there was a God or something that made this. It's amazing. <laughs> that is some intelligent design, that's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So the brain lacks oxygen, lacks blood, lacks sugar and energy, basically. And, you know, the brain increases the blood pressure in order to try to get more of that, but it really isn't, so it's really not helpful. 
Right. Just like the guy with the stroke. Yeah. You know, you can raise the blood pressure, but there's a little blockage somewhere in your artery that's not letting blood through, so more pressure isn't going to help. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> that's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to make sense. Yeah, so our brain is really like the su supercomputer in charge of it, running the entire system and sending out signals. Um, but there's... Yeah, you know what's, what's really interesting about that? is the brain can shut off the blood supply to just your fingertip. It doesn't have to be like your whole hand. Just one fingertip, the brain has control over and say, we'll just shut off the blood supply to that fingertip. And some people that have brain nose disease, actually that happens to them. Mm. The, blood, the, the, the brain can shut off the blood su supply to your heart. People really do die of a broken heart. It's a real thing. Mm. Uh, it can shut off the blood supply to every inch of your body except itself. It cannot close any blood vessels going to itself it only means it has of uh, regulating the flow in the brain is by total body pressure so when the brain needs more um oxygen sugar energy then it will it will close down all the blood vessels in your body and raise the blood pressure uh when it doesn't need very much it'll lower the blood pressure that's mm. that's the way the brain functions this is a bit of a tangent, but it's related. So we've talked about having a second brain in your gut. Is there, are there any controls in that part of your body as in the same way, or uh, or are those kind of two separate brains? I guess? That's a that's a great question. You know what? I don't know the answer to that um, <laughs> because uh, well, the the brain controls the blood supply to your uh, large intestine where all those bacteria are growing. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if the bacteria control their own supply of, of blood flow or anything, uh, nutrients or anything else. I think pretty much you have to feed them. What you're eating uh, is, is what those bacteria get. And so you, you are what you eat, uh, or really what it is, is what, whatever you eat, you're growing certain types of bacteria in your intestines. Mm. So this makes me think that brain health is ultra important in everything, like in, in blood pressure and diabetes and in everything, insulin resistance, metabolic disorders. Uh, and so like having a healthy brain, is it true that that's pretty much going to keep you young and healthy and vibrant? That's, that's pretty much it. If you think about what the brain does, uh, controlling everything in your body, the brain is taking 20% of all your blood. You know, it's just, it's just this much of your body, but it takes one fifth of all your blood supply is going through your brain. Hmm. Uh, and this is the really important. And it's all, you know, it's got a hard <laughs> shell uh, to protect it, right? So uh, it's, it, uh, the, uh, at least the way you're created, it's really, really important to number one, get a lot of blood flow, adequate food, energy supply, and oxygen and then number two protect it you know carefully like wearing a helmet and all Wear that. a helmet yeah yeah. <laughs> uh. yeah that's interesting um hmm i was just thinking too about you know how your brain and and i don't know if you can explain it but like the, the sense that like intuition in a sense like even people that find us and find remedies and find different solutions like it's like a part of their brain is like, okay, I need to find something that isn't going to cause all these side effects like medications. They know there's something in them that just knows that that's not good for them. It just, and it's fascinating, the human body and the brain and how it finds answers. And it just is, I don't know, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, I, I often think about that. I, I tend to think it's, uh, as much a spiritual thing as a as a, a mental thing of yeah. um, of uh, receiving answers, I kind of I kind of have this theory that everything that we we feel and think and all these bright ideas and people who are geniuses are really just like in tune to something beyond in to, in tune to a spiritual realm, and they like receive. Uh, they're like downloaded information. They go, ah, aha, I have mm -hmm. this bright idea. And it yeah. doesn't come from within them. I think it really comes from without them. And yeah. they uh, and, and they like capitalize on it. Or they're able to receive it, whereas other people, because they're not thinking about it and they wouldn't understand it, 
wouldn't be able to receive it. Yeah. So I think there's like a, a part of each. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And there's a lot of things you can do spiritually that are so good for you in, in a, like a holistic way. And so that's why we encourage people to, you know, take time every day to pray and meditate and, and think on good things as uh, Philippians four says, whatever is good and pure and lovely and noble, think on those things. And, and like right now in the time of the coronavirus, and thankfully we're starting to come over the hump on that and uh, coming out of that. But there's so much, you know, negative news and, and fear and it's like, you get to protect yourself and have the, you know, spiritual armor on in a sense to, remind yourself what's real and what's not and what's true and what's not so uh, yes. well let's take a look at uh, some questions that are coming in here so thanks everybody for uh, putting your questions in the chat or in the q a section on zoom here and uh, if you have if you're on facebook feel free to put them in the comments and leslie will uh, send them our way as well so let's start here at the top iwa says could i go off my glide view ride five milligram and double up on my Cinechroma. <laughs> oh, oh, well, um, that depends. See, I would look at somebody's test results and, and, and look at where their, their sugar, their um, blood sugar or glucose is. And, and um, I, I think I would need more information before I would make a recommendation like that. Um, yeah. As a rule, gliderite is pretty dangerous if you're getting lower blood sugar. So as your blood sugar drops low, glyburide is one of those medications that can make you get too low and you can get hypoglycemia from that. So, uh, so in that sense, uh, glyburide is one of the first ones that I take people off of when they're on the program, when they're starting the program. So I think that is a great question and one to be careful of. And you don't need to double up on the synochrome. The synochrome is formulated to be what it is, and more is not necessarily better. Uh, in other words, if you have enough chromium, more chromium isn't better. If you have enough vitamin C or vitamin D, uh, more vitamin D is not necessarily better. So, so no, you don't need to double up. Um, and but on the other hand, yes, glyburide is a very good one to look at first for getting off of if your blood sugar starts getting low. Mm -hmm. Talk to your doctor about that. <clears throat> yeah, I was going to say, talk to your doctor. And that's our, um, our general disclaimer on, on all of these calls is that uh, this is for informational purposes only. And, you know, everybody is unique and individual. So work with your own health practitioner. And if you, and Dr. Saunders is available for uh, virtual medicine and has a clinic that if you're interested, we can share that number as well. Uh, if you're looking for a doctor that has that can work directly with you and and uh, and get to the root cause as a functional MD. So, all right, <clears throat> let's go to Renee. Uh, how long does it take Nervala to help nerve pain? Um, great question, and the answer is it depends. <laughs> depends on how long you've had it and how much how advanced it is. Um, so Nervala has two things. One of them is the vitamin B1 called benfotiamine. It's a, a fat-soluble vitamin B1 that actually causes repair of the blood vessels. Remember, one of the issues is blood flow and the damage to the blood vessels that the high blood sugar and diabetes causes. So the, the vitamin B1, the benfotiamine, repairs the blood vessels, and so that improves the blood flow. So once you get blood flow back to the nerves, then they start functioning, or they can start returning to function because now they're getting nutrients. The other half of that is um, the alpha lipoic acid, which is uh, primarily for getting rid of inflammation. So the oxygen free radicals, it works in both the fat and the uh, water soluble compartments to get rid of oxygen free radicals and allow the mitochondria to function better which is where the energy is made. So um, those are sort of underlying, it's kind of like having an infrastructure that then allows the nerves to start functioning again. And depending on how far the progression has been, it may take a while to get back because nerves, nerves are not, they're not heal overnight. They're, they take a little bit of time to heal. Mm -hmm. 
But I've had people within weeks, a couple of weeks, start saying, you know what? I'm getting feeling back in my feet. I can actually um, go to sleep at night without all those horrible pins and needles. And uh, uh, so, uh, and, and that's often a, a thing too, if you think about it. If someone's completely numb, then they don't know they have any feeling at all. And then when the feeling starts coming back, what do they feel? Well, pins and needles. It's just like, you know, your arm's asleep when you wake up in the morning, if you've ever had that. Uh, the 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 return of feeling often starts with these this horrible sort of painful pins and needles. It's constant, and you know um, and that takes a while to heal. So it's going through that process until you actually have both feeling and without all of the the hypersensitivity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, lots of. <clears throat> Lots of good questions coming in here. And I just wanted to um, let people know that we have a YouTube channel called Barton Publishing Webinars, I believe. Uh, it's linked from bartonwebinar.com. So if you go to bartonwebinar.com, Leslie will put that in the chat here for you guys uh, to go to later. But you, from there, you can find our YouTube channel that has all of our recorded webinars from the past. And there's uh, over, I think we're close to 30 of them now getting specifically into a lot of these different uh, issues, including nirvana, neuropathy. <clears throat> um, and obviously most of them are, have to do with diabetes, but I just wanted to make sure you guys uh, are aware of that. When we talk about products like nirvana, uh, you can find out more by clicking on that from uh, bartonwebinar.com as well. And we talk about Cinechroma. And so, and then there's a few other products on there. And so one of, one of the products, I believe that's on Barton webinar, check me if I'm wrong, but it's our turmeric BP. Uh, and it looks like this, this is our uh, anti-inflammatory and antioxidant formula that works really well for blood pressure. So Scott, could you talk about turmeric and how that helps with blood pressure or the root cause behind blood pressure? Okay, so a lot of of the diseases and the problems that we have in our modern society has to do with inflammation. Uh, and a lot of the reason why we have inflammation is because of oxygen free radicals. And free radicals are made because you're making energy. It's not like they're not supposed to be there, they never were there. No, that's a part of life. And, uh, and because it's a part of life, uh, because we're always going to be making energy, we're going to make oxygen free radicals. So we need to be, have a way of quelling all of those. So if you think of it in a natural sense and, and think back for you know, thousands and thousands of years of the existence of, of life on earth, what, how, do, how have they all dealt with these oxygen free radicals that are a natural normal part of producing energy and having life? Um, well, you know, we have vitamins that we call antioxidant vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin E, and then all the colors. Uh, you know, we don't often think about it, but tomatoes, the red color of tomatoes um, is, uh, is an, is a, a, a free, uh, absorbs oxygen-free radicals and decreases inflammation, as well as the color of berries and even watermelon, you know, is, becomes a vitamin A. Um, so if you're eating food, you're going to get a lot of that uh, and then there's what we call superfoods. And the superfoods are the ones that have a, a, a lot of oxygen free radical absorbing capacity. Uh, and one of those is turmeric. Turmeric curcumin is wonderful and it works in several different ways. It works actually on the genome and it, it turns off the genes that create, or, uh, create uh, inflammation, the inflammatory mediators. Uh, and on the other hand, it absorbs the oxygen free radicals. So it works, because it works in two ways, it's especially good, which is why it's called a superfood as opposed to a simple uh, like carrot that's great also, but uh, the carrot just absorbs the free radicals straight. It has the beta carotene in it to absorb free radicals. Mm. Um, so uh, that's why turmeric is, is special in that way. It lowers inflammation. Uh, and absorbs the free radicals. Mm. <clears throat> awesome. Yeah, we've actually just recently improved the formula of turmeric BP. So now it is called turmeric BP plus and the formulation is just a little bit more potent and uh, yeah. So that's good stuff. And I think we might actually put more capsules in the bottle. I think there's 
60 capsules now, if I, if I remember right. So I have the old bottle in front of me here, so I don't have that. But anyways, turmeric BP, you can find on bartonwebinar.com, and it's, uh, it's very good stuff. So, okay, let's get keep going here. We got a blood pressure question um, from Renee again. Also, why does blood pressure go up when you are in pain, and how can you prevent that? Oh, great. Okay. Uh, again, remember what we talked about blood pressure is the pressure is not the problem. It's whatever's causing the blood pressure that's the problem. So um, when you have pain, uh, that causes the constriction of the blood vessels and more pressure to, uh, or your pressure to increase generally. So um, people who are in pain have higher blood pressure. So here's what happens. Someone walks into a doctor's office and they go, oh, doc, it hurts. It's killing me and it, it really hurts. And, they, and the doctor takes the blood pressure and goes, oh my gosh, your blood pressure is high. We better give you a blood pressure medication. But that's not going to help at all. All you need to do is get rid of the pain and then the blood pressure will just naturally come down. You don't have to deal with the pressure at all. The pressure could just be an indicator, a symptom. And then like the pain itself is a symptom. And so then you, if, if the doctor instead asked, well, why are you in pain? Well, um, every time I take a sip of, of my tea, my eye hurts. Uh, and so then the doctor can say, well, just take the spoon out of the cup uh, and then you won't be in pain anymore. Um, and then your problem is solved and your blood pressure won't go up because you uh, won't be in pain. I don't know if everybody caught that one, but that was a good one. Poking yourself in the eye with a spoon in your cup. Ah, I like it. <laughs> uh, so, all right, does blood pressure cause more pain or no? Um, no. No, the, bl the blood pressure, um, when, when people are studied who have very high blood pressure and they could be like you know, 200 over 150, you know, really high numbers, um, and they, they don't notice anything. They don't feel anything. Um, it's, it's usually the other way around. People who have, are in pain, the blood pressure goes up because of this uh, reaction to the pain causes uh, epinephrine, adrenaline. Adrenaline causes constriction of blood vessels, which causes the blood pressure to go up. So the pain causes high blood pressure, not the other way around. Okay, good stuff. All right, question from Gordon. Um, hi, Gordon. So neuropathy in toes, the brain can't send more blood there. What's the issue here? Okay. Um, that's why. Okay. So we just talked about uh, Nervala and why that was important. And that, that is the issue right there. You have one issue is the blood vessels themselves. They're not working. So you're not getting blood flow. So um, the nerves are dying, but that's not the only thing. Um, one of the big problems of diabetes is foot infections. And if any of you who have diabetes, you've gone to your doctor, doctor says, make sure you examine your feet and make sure you look, just make sure there's no infections there because if you don't have good feeling and you get an infection, it's gonna spread all over the place. Well, why does it spread? Why won't it spread in me or Joe or, or anybody uh, who doesn't have diabetes? Well, because they have good blood flow. People with diabetes don't have good blood flow. So, um, the brain doesn't control that blood flow anymore because the blood vessels aren't working. That's where the issue lies. And that's why that Nervala has those two things in it. One to improve the blood flow and then the other one to improve the uh, oxygen free radicals. Hmm. Excellent question, by the way. Yeah, very that. good. So let's, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about um, the similarity between diabetes and high blood pressure as far as how to get it normalized and, and fix it. So we, we've talked about this a lot in the past, but diabetes is really just too much, too much of a lot of things. And you become resistant to a lot of things, too much insulin, too, too much sugar, and you get resistant to insulin. So let's talk about that. How do we, how do we fix high blood pressure? How do we get to the root, root cause? How do we fix it? Okay. So when, when your brain uh, okay, <laughs> let me go back a little bit more. Um, when your blood sugar is high over a long period of time, the glucose transport proteins to the brain are diminished, and so you're not getting blood into your brain or not getting sugar glucose into the brain cells where they need to be 
So then the brain cells are going, hey, I need more here. The blood pressure goes up. The blood pressure goes up because they can't make enough energy and you're actually dying when they do uh, PET scans, which are a scan on the brain to see the function of the brain. You can actually see areas of the brain where there's no function. The blood's not flowing there. They're, they're not getting enough energy. Uh, and so uh, if you then go on a ketogenic diet, essentially phase one of the, um, the diabetes reversal kit, um, the Bi diabetes solution kit, um, that phase one part of the program is to get that blood sugar really far down so that you start increasing the number of, of glucose transport proteins getting into your brain. And then when you get more sugar getting into your brain, your brain cells are going, oh, now I can function. It's not, it's not a, a, a burden anymore. It's not a hardship. I, I'm, I'm able to actually um, make some energy use thing and function normally. Then they're not sending signals to, to raise the blood pressure and the blood pressure just naturally goes down over time. And it's beautiful. The system is so perfect. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so in the diabetes uh, program, phase one is 20 grams of carbs until you get to really healthy blood sugar numbers, right? And is that 20 grams of carbs pretty much the same thing for blood pressure that's going to work then for you know, what we eat? Yeah. yeah well, it's, it's, not, it's not the 20 grams of carbs. In fact, if you did zero carbs, it would work just as well. If you were fasting, it would work just as well. The, the, the real key is to get the blood sugar down to a normal level so that you have uh, enough of those glucose transport proteins so that your brain can function and get enough energy. But the other cool thing about that, that part of the program that's 20 gram carbs is, is you're allowed to eat fat and you're allowed to burn the fat off of your body. So, and when you do that, you make something called ketones. And ketones are a kind of a low octane fuel for the brain as well. There's parts of the brain, most of the brain can use ketones for fuel and that doesn't require glucose transport protein. So you often get an immediate benefit before your blood sugar even gets to normal. Your blood pressure will already start going down because your brain now has ketones to burn because you're burning fat. Whereas before during diabetes, blood sugar is always so high you can never burn fat. Insulin blocks you from burning fat. So as the, so as the insulin goes down because you're not eating carbs, then the ketones go up and your brain starts getting fuel and it's going, ah, oh, fuel at last. And, uh, and then blood pressure can start dropping. It's awesome. Mm. Yeah, that's really good. Thanks for clarifying that. Didn't mean to ask the same question three or four different types of ways, but uh, just, I figured well, I might have some of those questions others may as well. <laughs> yeah, if I can muddy the waters, I'll do it. <laughs> oh no, you do anything but that. So. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Uh, quick clarification question: When we talk about twenty grams on the type or the phase one, is that net carbs or total carbs? Well, you could answer that. It's net carbs. <laughs> yep. um, to total carbs includes fiber, and fiber is the good stuff. That's what your your good bacteria need. That's what Joe was saying. Your second brain in your gut has to be fed, and they're fed on the fiber. Uh, and so that doesn't affect your blood sugar, or insulin, or anything. So what really affects the blood sugar and insulin is net carbs, and that's sugar starch, not fiber. Yeah, excellent. All right. Okay, let's see here. So what is what is a healthy uh, blood pressure range for people with diabetes, or just for anybody? What's high? What's low? Okay. A healthy blood pressure range is uh, the, the systolic mm, as high as 130, as low as 100. Um, between 100 and 130 is a, a decent range. But you know, there's variability in people all the time. So you may find if you're taking your blood pressure frequently, gosh, every morning my blood pressure is up to 150, and then but at night it's 110. Uh, what the heck? Well. All that means is that your brain is saying, I need blood flow and I don't need blood flow. And because that's how your brain controls its own blood flow is by your general blood pressure. So, uh, so the, the change in blood pressure 
is just fine. So if it goes up sometimes to 160, 180, that by itself isn't a problem. Uh, it, it should though, when you're quiet and relaxed and not excessively using your brain or anything else, um, it should come down to the 120 range, somewhere around 120, 110 to 130, something like that. In the bottom part, so one, uh, what, what's that number? Yeah, uh, that gets complicated. The, uh, so, the, so there's, of course, two numbers. There's 120 over 80, right? And, and that's an optimal number. Um, but I've been just talking about systolic numbers. But what often happens um, when people have get hardening of the arteries, uh, their, their lower number will go, actually go down as the higher number goes higher, and that's called a wide pulse pressure. And so the reason you want to know both numbers is, is normal people have blood flow because the heart pumps. And as the heart pumps, the, the blood vessels relax. And then the heart relaxes and the blood vessels constrict to push the blood through. So you have kind of a, this kind of a thing going on all the time. Um, and, but when you have hard arteries, when they're like pipes and they're not compliant anymore, then you have the heart has to pump into those pipes to get that pressure all the way through those, those capillaries in every part of your body. Uh, and so it's, it's, the heart has to do a lot more work. So then that's the higher blood pressure. And then when the heart relaxes, there's nothing to, const to constrict to keep that pressure up in the arteries. So it drops really low. So you have a high, low, high, low. That um, pulse pressure is usually an indicator of hardening of the arteries. So it's good to know what your, what your total pulse pressure is. If it's, if it's you know, 160 over 80, uh, or 160 over 70, um, then that tells you you might have hardening of the arteries or if your arteries aren't working well to <clears throat> be compliant and, and strict. Excellent. Okay. Leslie, I'm going to bring you in here. Um, <laughs> if you can, let's see, you want to unmute yourself, but if you can uh, ask a few more questions that have come in, I'm going to take my blood pressure here and uh do this in the background while you guys are talking and then we'll reveal my results here in, in a minute here so awesome. go ahead and keep us going okay i'm actually going to go to our chat we had some questions come in there let me see what i can find here um <clears throat> oh why do you get a hamstring charlie horse when you are sleeping is that diabetic related oh good question um no not really diabetic related but it could be um, a lot of people with diabetes get um, polyuria where they're uh, losing a lot of urine and it changes their electrolytes. So the, the, the hamstring or the calf uh, pain uh, that comes on from cramps, especially at night, night cramps, uh, is from changes in the electrolyte balance. And electrolytes, there's four electrolytes that are affected, um, calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium. So uh, sodium chloride is salt and potassium. Uh, most of us Americans are deficient in potassium. Um, I went and had a meal at uh, Chick-fil-A uh, yesterday. I don't normally eat there, but my daughter wanted to go. So I'm like, okay, fine, I'll get it. <laughs> um, and I was really surprised. Like I'm looking at this food and like nothing has potassium in it. It's got a little bit of meat, a little bit of flour, you know, for the, um, for the bun, uh, the potatoes actually have a little bit of potassium in them. The potatoes have some. But I can see if people eat in that way continuously, they're going to have low potassium. And that's a common problem in the United States is to have a relative dehydration, a, a intracellular dehydration from a lack of potassium. And then magnesium is the um, electrolyte that causes your muscles to relax. So calcium causes contraction of the muscles and magnesium allows relaxation of the muscles. And so when people get these spasms, it's very often a magnesium deficiency. Uh, so the calcium magnesium balance is one and the sodium potassium balance is the other. And any of those uh, issues could cause that. And with diabetes, uh, there are people who are urinating more and and uh, they don't balance their electrolytes well, 
And so they're more likely to get those kinds of issues. Wow. Okay. I remember years ago, I called you. I did something to my lower back and I was in so much pain and it was all muscle. And you said, just take a bunch of magnesium. You'll be fine. And I was so mad because I was like, that's never going to work. It's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. And I did it. And I remember being like, this is heaven. I can function again. It worked really, really well for those muscles. Um, okay. So let's see. Oh, I wanted to mention this too, especially for, uh, for those of you who are on Facebook, uh, many of you are catching the replay, which is wonderful. Uh, go ahead and post your questions in the comments because we may try to address those on our next webinar. Okay. So we, we know those are important, but catch our next webinar, leave those comments and we'll try to get to as many. As we can. Okay. Joe, are you ready? Or do you want me to look for more questions? 127 over 74. Woohoo! You know, see, that's a, that's a nice pulse pressure. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, not high, so it, doesn't in, it indicates you have good compliance of your arteries. Uh, and that's essentially a perfect number. That's where Pika should be. I was a little worried because this is the third time I did it. And the first time I did it, it was 150 over 75. But I was wondering, like, maybe it's because I was just up walking around and, and that needed to rest a little bit but uh because the, the webinar was two. so exciting yeah yeah well no that, you know what often people come into a doctor's office and they're so kind of nervous and tense in a doctor's office their blood pressure will shoot up and they end up on blood pressure medications <laughs> i always tell people go home take your blood pressure when you're quiet and relaxed and and do it every day and then and then text them to me or send them to me email in a week and let's go over your numbers um because you know, very often just being in a doctor's office, what I do, if somebody has really high blood pressure and they're in the office, uh, I tell them to take, do the yoga breathing technique, take a deep breath, let it out, and then take another deep breath and hold it for about 20 seconds. Uh, and then I take their blood pressure again. And, and most of the time it comes down to normal, mm. just from a couple of breathing. That's a, good, that's a good tip right there for, for everyday stress. Yeah, stress relief in general like breathing is such an underrated thing that we don't really think about because it's always we're at it's just happening automatically all the time but yeah just yeah. I saw that today where someone was laying on their back and putting their legs up against a wall and they would lay like that for quite some time and then they'd find that anxiety would go away their their um, blood pressure would regulate um i think it's a yoga pose possibly um, but kind of interesting. So is like sitting on the lying on the ground with your feet and you know, your legs up against the wall. Yep. It's probably a pretty good hamstring stretch as well, which I know those <laughs> hamstrings that, can get tight. <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking. That, that sounds like a good hamstring stretch. <laughs> yeah. I think all any kind, kind of stretching and breathing that you can do is, is only going to be beneficial for you so that's good stuff all right keep going leslie you're doing great yeah okay so let me see where we're at here um i'm gonna ask about this let's see from krish i don't think we covered this the facts you presented earlier about the brain and adequacy of blood supply uh compels me to ask two questions one when we take medications such as herbicertin and alamodipine I butchered that, I'm probably. Irbisartan and amlodipine. Okay, yep. The <laughs> physician uses the term uh, titration and adjusts the dose. For diabetics, what is the ideal BP reading for diabetics for diastolic and systolic measure? Well, the ideal reading doesn't change. Uh, the 120 over 80 is a great reading. When you're quiet and relaxed, it should, should come down to around 120 over 80. Well. Well, that's not true for everybody. Women, especially uh, young women, have progesterone. And if they make a lot of progesterone, uh, progesterone relaxes smooth muscles. So they won't tend to have higher blood pressure. They'll tend to have lower blood pressure. So a woman who's 100 over 60, that's, that's normal. That's a normal young woman's blood pressure. And that's not worrisome as far as low. The only concern with low blood pressure is dizziness. So if people are saying, well, you know, I can't stand up without holding on to something, 
that's a problem. You got to deal with that. That's low blood pressure. And there's some reason for that, a dehydration or whatever. Um, there's a reason for that. But the high, on the high side, um, it, it's perfectly normal for blood pressure to go up to 160, 170, 150. That, those are okay. As long as it comes down to normal when you're quiet and relaxed, it should come into the 120 over 80 range. Okay. Um, this is interesting. Can you suggest a protein powder? Bob is wondering. Yes. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was going to be your answer, but I had to ask it. <laughs> Okay, um, protein, uh, there's some really good information on this. If you go to uh, the USC Longevity Institute, it is Dr. Uh, Walter Longo uh, is a PhD researcher uh, who does a lot of work on this. And you look at uh, protein and how, what happens when people eat too much protein. Um, and it does not promote longevity. It actually, uh, just the opposite. People tend to get, they're more likely to get things like cancer, uh, especially cancer, but uh, to die of cancer from, from too much protein. So you can't avoid protein. There's, there's no way, like broccoli has more protein than mother's milk. Um, protein, uh, you know, ounce for ounce. Uh, protein is everywhere. You can't avoid it because everything is made of uh, or uses proteins, everything that's living. So um, even even if you're you know fully vegan, uh, you get plenty of protein. That's that's not really an issue. So um, the other half of that is uh, proteins. By and large, um, I, I don't know percentage. Ninety percent of them are junk food. They're just junk food. Just avoid them. You know what? Don't. Don't buy a big bottle of egg protein powder. Just eat an egg. You know what? The egg's got other stuff in it, like lecithin and, and, and vitamin B12, the things that in it that are really good for you besides all the protein that it has. I think in one thing, you know, often I will look for protein drinks as well, mostly when I'm in a hurry or I want something quick that I don't have to plan and it's just easy. Or maybe in the mornings, I don't feel like eating a lot of food. So I think meal planning and meal prepping really helps to avoid that. So something to really think about too. Um, let's see. Uh, this is from Iwa. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Can meds and certain foods create a leaky gut and heartburn? How can you get rid of it? Oh, that's another whole webinar all by itself because there's a lot of information out there. I don't know if any of you have heard of Dr. Gundry. He's been doing a lot of, of uh, promotion on this kind of thing, leaky gut, um, with foods and, and with good foods, you know, things that you think are great. If you were to take a, a handful of red beans and eat them, uh, it would cause so much leaky gut, you could die. You know, it's, it, they're, they're not benign. Um, but... You know, so before we eat beans, we pressure cook them or soak them and pour off the supernatant and then, and then we boil them for a long time and get rid of a lot of the lectins that cause that leaky gut. Um, there are a lot of medications that can cause leaky gut too. Uh, the medications for diabetes, for blood pressure, uh, anything that's toxic to the lining of the intestines uh, can, can be a cause of leaky gut. And if you react to it, and you may not know you react to it, you could be causing leaky gut and not even know it because you're the only one that's reacting to that causing leaky gut. And, and then it's not like common, like everybody who gets this is getting leaky gut. So um, that's a great question. So I, if I could do a corollary to that and just say, okay, so let's say that there are foods that cause leaky gut and there are medications that do that. And you're on medications for diabetes, for example, that'll, that'll do that. What do you do about it? Um, the intestines repair when you make a hormone called ghrelin. Ghrelin is made by the stomach uh, when it's empty. So the more you have an empty stomach, the more you'll repair all of your intestines. So the foods you eat will not be toxic to you. The medications you take will not be toxic to you as long as you have an empty stomach as long as possible. So we've often talked about the uh, uh, 610 reset where you don't eat anything after six. Well, 
research has now shown that if you if you don't eat anything after three, you it improves a lot more, especially things that you already have like diabetes or leaky gut actually improve a lot more if you only eat two meals a day, one at seven, one at two. Uh, and so that you don't eat anything after three o'clock in the afternoon until seven o'clock the next morning. Um, and it needs to be at that time also for the circadian rhythm reasons. So there's so much involved in this uh, leaky gut, but yes, you can repair it. Um, even if you're eating foods that contain lectins uh, and, that, and can cause leaky gut, it can re be repaired every day. Okay, uh, let's do, should we do one more question, Joe? What do you think? Let's do it, and I, I wanna do a little promo quick. So this is the High Blood Pressure Solution Kit, and this was updated in 2019 with uh, new information, uh, better recipes, a better grocery list. So we got a meal plan and grocery list. Uh, we have a workbook, we have the resource guide, the three-phase blood pressure remedy plan, and the Heart Healthy Cookbook. So this is like in the workbook form and you can get this. If you go to bartonpublishing.com, we have this on the site there that you can order it from. It's uh, $19.97 for the digital version. And you can also order the uh, workbook version as well. Just wanted to plug that quick because this is if you want if you want to learn more about high blood pressure and how to fix it, it's all right in here and uh, brought to you by the Barton Publishing team. And the other thing is the turmeric EP is really good for this. Had a lot of people find this is helpful in reducing inflammation and blood pressure. So go to, um, yeah, bartonwebinar.com to find that as well. And I had one question that I was going to ask you, because you mentioned potassium, Dr. Saunders. What is the best way to get potassium in what you're eating or consuming? And, and is bananas, are bananas a good source of that? Okay, that's a great question, because everybody asks that. Um, um, potassium is so irritating. You can't like get it in your veins. You get very tiny amounts if you put it in your veins. Uh, our pills actually are very small amounts in pills because it's irritating. It actually makes your fats into soap and the soaps are irritating. Uh, so um, potassium is not something that's just easy like, like oh, I can drink a, a potassium drink or drink potassium broth. Um, and, uh, so, it, it needs to be done on a regular basis, like a continuous basis, getting your potassium all the time. Every, every natural food has potassium. The really high in potassium, like per gram, um, bananas, yes, bananas definitely have more potassium per gram than many other foods. But if you look at like the white beans, they have a lot of potassium in them. Uh, and, and other beans, uh, peas, lentils, um, uh, whole grains have potassium. Anything, anything that's grown or growing has potassium. So all of the natural foods have potassium. And anything that's processed, there's two things that are taken out. One is potassium, the other is magnesium. And those are the two things that most of us are deficient in. So that is an excellent question of how to get your potassium. Daily basis, eat natural foods, whole foods, fruit, vegetables, beans, uh, lentils, nuts and seeds, grains, and then greens, salads. Those kind of things is where you're going to get potassium. Awesome. And we've got those on page uh, 22 and 23 in the uh, diabetes or <laughs> high blood pressure solution kit. So a good list of foods that are high in potassium and magnesium, calcium. Um, yeah, lots of good stuff in here. So, okay, well, we are uh, at that time and over that time. So thanks again for uh, answering all these questions, Dr. Saunders. Thanks for uh, hopping on here and being so helpful as always. Thanks everybody for joining us. And uh, we're going to be back here next week at our, at this new time on noon central on Tuesdays, talking to all things type two diabetes. And uh, we appreciate your questions. Thanks for hopping on. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, Leslie. Appreciate it. All right. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.